Hello, I'm Mark Lamus. I'm the artistic director of the Westport Country Playhouse, and I'm very, very pleased to be able to present uh, three friends of mine, one of whom has written an important new book about Thornton Wilder's Our Town, which the Playhouse did a very important production of in 2002. We'll hear more about that from Annie Keefe, our artistic associate, from Jake Robards, who is one of our trustees and also a tremendously gifted actor, and the author of the book, Howard Sherman. Howard, welcome. Thank you. It's, it's nice to see everybody. I think this is a sort of return visit for Howard because you actually didn't you get your very first professional job was working at the Playhouse? I went to work at the Westport Country Playhouse two weeks after I graduated college. And I did two summers back in the days when it was 11 shows in 11 weeks. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. So let's start off with this book, the title of which is? Another Day's Begun, Thornton Wilder's Our Town in the 21st Century. I've got to ask that question. Why just the 21st century productions? Are you why are you just concentrating on those productions? The 21st century has hardly begun. Um, well, we're we're t 20 years into it now, so so we're a ways. And I was simply trying to define some universe because in looking at our town, there are so many productions over so many years that if I had tried to do a history or represent um, the totality of production, I'd be writing this forever. Um, there were 650 productions of Our Town in the first year and a half after it was available to be licensed back in the 30s. So imagine how that's gone in the in the subsequent 81 years it's it's just enormous so i had to figure out something that i could put my arms around mm -hmm. and where does the playhouse production fit in in your history well the playhouse production first of all was one that when i put the book was thinking about putting the book together i knew had to be in it um it partly because of my own affection for the Westport Country Playhouse, and and in fact, because the production went to Broadway, and to date was the last Broadway production of our town. So that seemed pretty essential. And in fact, it's the oldest of the productions in the book from 2002. All of the other productions were subsequent to it. I think it's important to note that um, Thornton Wilder himself appeared on, this, on the stage of the Playhouse as the stage manager in a, in a production long ago of uh, Our Town. And when you and I were talking about this the other day, you mentioned that he did that quite often. That it wasn't all that. I always thought it was such a special thing that he did it at our theater, but apparently he did it at quite a few theaters, right? Well, it's certainly special just to have had him do it, um, but he actually uh, appeared in the Broadway run for two weeks when Frank Craven, the original stage manager, went on vacation. And once the show began to be done in summer theaters beginning in 1939, he would troop around the old straw hat circuit and do it. And not in a, oh, not a, with a particular production. He would apparently just show up on Monday and he would do it at a theater and then they'd finish their run and he'd show up at another theater on Monday. Um, and he did that on and off for 20 years. He also played the stage manager in the 1946 radio version. So it was a role he played very, very often. And it leads a lot of people to say, well, is the stage manager Thornton Wilder? And that alone sparks a lot of conversation. What's you spent you spent quite a lot of time working on this book. What have you, what's special about Our Town to Howard Sherman? I think what's special about Our Town to me is the depth of feeling that I've experienced in seeing the play more in recent years. I, I openly confess to the fact that when I was younger, I could look at it and say, this is a nice play, but uh, now it makes me weep. Um, so, so that experience is, is what endeared it to me. I have to say that having spent 
a couple of years with it and having had all of these incredibly generous directors and designers and actors talk to me about what it has been to spend time in Grover's Corners. I see things in the play. I've been shown things in the play and then I've discovered things in the play that I would have never gotten. I mean, the whole premise of the book was that the people who do this play know so much about it from having done it. Um, and so rather than trying to do any kind of literary analysis, it's really very much about what is it like to live in Grover's Corners for a month or two months or, or however long it runs. What was it like for you, Annie? Um, it was a, one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life to, uh, to experience it over and over. Like Howard, um, I have this feeling that people should be locked in a room once a year and be forced to watch it so that we remember how quickly things passed and pass and how we don't realize what's happening while we're living it. And it's, it's just a shame. It, uh, it, it was an important time for us to do it as well because it, it came right after 9-11 and it was a play that we had always wanted to do, but it's very big. It's, I think we had 23 people or something like that by the time you got all the kids and the other bodies involved. Um, so, you know, we didn't even have dressing room space when we did it, it was the old playhouse, but it had always been a favorite of Joanne's. I had done it uh, at Long Wharf with Frank Converse and Hal Holbrook. Uh, and um, we, were, we were very excited to be able to do it again. And it, it felt important for us to do. And you brought together a lot of local people from our town, or <laughs> our town. We did. We did. We wanted to do our town in our town. That was uh, that's what spoke to Joanne. She said, "You know, we need it now. We need to come together. We need to pull the town together in light of the recent events." And um, so we we also realized that we have this wealth of talent right in our town. And we even used a lot of the, the local people as extras and, um, and just reached out to our friends and no one turned us down. It, the, uh, the hardest job I had was finding a stage manager. I didn't have a stage manager three days before we started, it, which was just ridiculous. We just couldn't find the person that was free to do it for us. And one of those local people is, is in the little box next to you. Exactly. Jake Robards, how old were you when you played in our town? How old was I? Well, I got to do some math and that's not <laughs> that's not so easy uh, since it was quite a while ago. I guess I was in my late 20s when I did it. And uh, it just to speak to what Annie said, it really just felt like a community coming together to do this show. And uh, and Howard, there was a bunch of uh, references to the camp nature of the the atmosphere and it really was it was something where we all knew it was something special that uh paul and joanne and annie brought to the playhouse but they all brought us together with these huge open arms and created this lovely space for us to to live together in grover's corners for that time this was just a magical magical experience can i ask you a question jake i'm, I'm curious and i'm not looking for praise for the book but um, you're the first member of a, our town company that's profiled in the book who's actually had a chance to look at it. Some of the people who are in the book have seen it, but you're the first. What was the experience of seeing what other members of your company remembered of it and what did it trigger in you? Um, you know, it was so lovely to just hear the stories, uh, just to revisit, walk down memory lane of uh, what a wonderful time that was and how it really brought us all together in such a, a magical way. And I think there was something, we all knew it was something special that uh, that Paul was doing. it, And, you know, there were some other very famous actors in their own right there, but we all had this, you know, school boy, school girl enthusiasm of showing up. Don't you remember it, Annie, the, everybody of that first day or all throughout the run, it was something we all felt was was really magical. So, uh, and I think, 
I just get the feeling that Paul felt that too. We there was something magic, something magic in the air, and I'm not saying that our production was the greatest production of all time, but it certainly reflected was a reflection of our community, and that's, I think, what the goal was, uh, Annie. Yeah, yeah, and of course it was. Paul hadn't been on stage in ever so long, so yeah. everybody was aware of that as well. So that in addition to just loving being together. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a company, every time a first day of rehearsal happens, this this family situation starts and it happens so quickly. It's almost magical, it's, that's the only word for it. But I think the truth is everybody was, was there for Paul. Everybody was bringing the A game for Paul because they knew that he wasn't a kid anymore and he was coming back onto the stage after an enormous it been 34 years for him oh, since wait. he was on well, Broadway yeah, in was, Baby Want the Kiss. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. And then he came back in 2004 and did Trumbo. But in 2002, he hadn't been on stage since 1954. So, yeah. so yeah. everybody wanted to bring it for Paul. Was he nervous, Annie, about going back into live theater? Could you tell? You know, if he was, I wasn't aware of it. I think... Um, it was just a muscle he was getting used to using again. I, he never said, oh my God, I'm, uh, what have I done? I've made this huge mistake, you know, can I take it back? Uh, he may have said it to Joanne, but he never, I, he never let on that he was particularly nervous. He's such a prankster anyway. I mean, he, he's, he's the epitome of coming to work to play. He loved playing. What role did you play, Jake? Can you remind us? Uh, I was Howie Newsom. And how we do delivering the milk, the milkman. Right. So we basically, you know, he opens every act, delivering, delivering the milk and doing the milk run. So it was. And you're kind of young for it. You were certainly right. I mean, I always think of Howie Newsom yeah. as one of the older characters, and and as a result, I'll tell a little tale out of school. In, at the end of the Broadway run, one of our understudies <laughs> made a video with one of the early camera phones. Um, and it was about how he knew some and how he was, you know, slipping it to all the ladies in Grover's Corners. <laughs> it was, and so they would stick their heads out of their dressing room. I can remember Jane Curtin and Jane Atkinson going, oh, hello, Howie. Yes, I'll take a pint of milk today. It was, <laughs> I have it somewhere, Jake. I'm going to use it to blackmail you. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But you know, it's funny with it, with a character <laughs> like Howie, you know, when people look at our town, you know, they don't necessarily make Howie their first thought, but you have to look at the play and say, why is this guy showing up at the beginning of all three acts? Now, whether it's that he's servicing the local ladies in their spare time, um, but, but what is it? What is it to be? And what does he represent? And I mean, Jake, did you think about that at all? I mean, the only thing I ever thought about was just the, the consistency of life and how everyone was reliable and everyone did their job no matter what. And they knew that how he would show up, deliver the milk and that that milk would be used to feed the family. And it was that how news was spread around town about the birth or death of people. So. It, it's so, you know, I, I remember as a child having a milkman come and he would, I think he came maybe twice a week, but it was an exciting time that you could hear the the bottles that were left out um, in the back porch there. And I'd run, and it was one of my jobs to go grab the milk and put it in if I heard it. So, and I think that may have been just because it was a small town in Connecticut that they still had the milkman because it was being phased out. But um, yeah, in the play, it was, uh, yeah, it's an interesting commentary on what life was like, obviously, so. It's, yeah, it seems that Wilder's main concern with almost all of his work was this sense of life as a great sort of stream of, you know, uh, a quotidian um, a likeness and day in, day out, people come, people go, you know, the long Christmas dinner, they get born, they're born, they die, they leave the table, others come back. And it seems that he was always Pullman Car Hiawatha, a wonderful play. Um, he was concerned with this sense of time passing. And so much of our town is about 
not noticing how time is passing until it stops passing for you altogether. Um, he seemed very spiritual in terms of always to me, it seemed like a very spiritual writer, uh, though I don't think he was religious, um, but he certainly had a sense of the mystery of life and the, the continuity that life requires. The milkman comes each time, you know. And yet at the same time, in our town, because we're in several different years, it's not strictly chronological, we also watch change. There, there is absolute change. There are people, I, I talk about this a lot, which is that I think a lot of people don't actually pay attention to what our town is about, which is, yes, about what we have to realize. But a lot of people say, oh, it's, an, it's a play about life in the early 1900s. And that's not really what it's about at all, because even within what people think back on, as being a charming scene. There's constant change. Even in the small bits of life, there are, there are choices. The choices in our town that people don't get to make, that they'd like to make, go by very quickly. Emily wanted to make speeches all her life. George's mother really wanted to go to Paris. We know she doesn't get there. So, even in the in the constant flow and just our drop in at occasional points, it's it's also about the disappointments and the opportunities not taken. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How are productions? Do you think in the twenty first century? How are they different from productions before before this time? Again, because I nobody can see all the productions of our town. Um, and because my focus was so strictly the 21st century, I think certainly a lot of people probably did the production much as they imagined it might have been done back in 1938 with, with a three-piece suit on the stage manager and a hat and sometimes even a corn cob pipe for some reason and everything just as it was. I think the Wilder family as stewards of this property have been exceptionally shrewd and exceptionally open to different ways of doing our town. Um, the Even Thornton Wilder knew of a production before he passed away, which was probably the first time the stage manager was played by a woman. The first fully professional production was a year after he passed away. There was a completely multiracial production in Los Angeles in 1968. Um, so what would seem to be the boundaries of when the play was written for and the time periods of the play itself, I think there's been a lot of opportunity and it's just increased to find new ways of doing our town, not by mucking it up with tons of scenery and tons of costumes and special effects because simplicity is vital to it. But I think certainly in, in the past 10 or 20 years, people have kept finding both new reasons for doing it as well as new ways to express it. Because as Annie said, the Westport production was done in direct response to 9-11 um, from, from the conversations I had with Annie and Allison Harris. Joanne had been talking about doing it for a while, but it was really the impetus of that great tragedy, that great horror that that pushed them to to finally do it. And there are other productions like that in the book. One of the productions that I profiled was at the uh, Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester, England, and it was programmed immediately after an arena bombing there in 2017, an Ariana Grande concert. There was a bombing, there was loss of life, and the artistic director, Sarah Francom, put the play on five months later, specifically because she wanted that play in that community at that time. And there is, I mean, any play resonates according to what's going on in the world around it, but there is something about our town that can be for people both a bringing together and perhaps even a healing because always, it's about the small things. Yeah, absolutely. 
I always loved the poster for Greg Mosher's Broadway revival many years ago because it was the planet Earth. <laughs> it was so beautiful to see the words our town and to see the whole planet. Um, and he got a lot of pushback from Bernie Gersten and others on the staff who did not want that to be the poster for the show. And it he prevailed. And I was always grateful that he did because I thought it was a fantastic message that never resonated inside the production in a very specific way, but nevertheless somehow was there, um, you know, as you went into the theater. Well, I might argue with you. I, I think it's actually drawn directly from the play, but people get, again, they get so focused about the details of the town. But Rebecca Gibbs at the end of Act One is reading a letter that her friend got. And right. what's the address? The United States of America, the continent of North America, Western Hemisphere, the Earth, the solar system, the universe, the mind of God. Greg, with that poster, took this very macro view of what our town was about when a lot of people focus on the micro. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, what did you learn that you, uh, what sort of surprised you the most in, in working on the book, Howard? The, the two biggest surprises were uh, the number of people who actually didn't know it, but thought they knew what it was about. Um, it's kind of hand in hand that there was, there really is a whole strata of people who just say, oh, our town, it's that old fashioned play and it's about life a hundred years ago and it's cute, but it's not really for us now. And that all of these people I talked to, more than a hundred people, I mean, they come out of it with such passion. It's, it's extraordinary, even to the point um, that one of the actresses who played Emily has um, a bit of Emily's dialogue tattooed on her now. I mean, people really commit to this play and it, it seems to help them find something. I'm curious, I wanna ask Annie a question because we, we've we mentioned that there was um, the Long Wharf production that you did in 88 um, with Hal Holbrook and then the production in 2002, but you also were a bit of an advisor when Hartford Stage did it again in around 2008, is that right? Yeah, I, I assisted Gregory Boyd in his production with Hal Holbrook at, oh. at uh, Hartford Stage. He he directed it and he, he just wanted another eye and I wasn't doing anything. So I, I went to Hartford for a month and watched Our Town again with Hal and, and uh, no, Frank wasn't in. Frank was in that too. Yes, Frank was in all three of those productions. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, but I'm curious. Did the did you see things in the play over time? Did it change for you? You did it twice with Hal. You did it once with Paul. The other, most of the company, except for Frank, was different. Yeah, you know, it's 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 um. I tend to come at everything from a like a stage manager, somebody who's who's trying to watch everything happen and stop all the bad things from happening and um so so i watch it with a very different eye every time but i'm also such a huge fan of the play that you know lines come in in my daily life that just i i think of all the time part of it has to do with having done it three times and having watched the showtime that we made from our production and and the the old movie, it's, you know, it's very much been a part of my life and I try to keep it that way. It's, I read David Copperfield, Anna Karenina and Our Town over and over mm. again because they all bring something to me, uh, a reminder in a way, you know? Uh, it, it's interesting to see, we all three of the productions were very much alike. You know, there was no, there was no David Cromer uh, view of it where you put it into the audience. I, I never saw it. It sounded like a fascinating production, but it was uh, all three of the productions were very similar in feel. Uh, the the miming, you know, that's always a conversation that you have about how much miming do you do and who's good at it and who isn't. And, you know, I think of you with your horse, Jake, and your and your milk bottles. And, and then you, you add on top of that your New England accent. And it's uh, it, it all felt pretty much the same and all wonderful. 
at the same time. So not much different. I'm curious to ask Jake, and this is sort of a two-part question, um, would you want to be in our town again? And is there a role you would want to play? Uh, I would love to be in our town again. It's just, it's a play that never gets old in my mind. I remember seeing it, a high school production of it when I was in middle school and being transported by it. It was when my sister was in the show, I believe. I don't even remember what part she played, but I remember seeing the show, but I would love to be a part of our town again. Um, I think editor Webb would be fun. Doc Gibbs, you know, I'm starting to come into that. And of course, stage manager would be a, a, an amazing role as well. So Simon um, Stimson. Simon Stimson. Uh, that's a very interesting role too. It's a fascinating it's a role because there's, there's not a lot of lines, but he is, he is the other in that community. It's not a perfect, people again, in their memory, oh, it's about this perfect little town. Well, it's not a oh, Remind us who that is. That Simon Vinson is the choir director who is, to use a term that wasn't used in, in the era the play was written, who's an alcoholic. He's, he's embittered. He's troubled. There has been some manner of tragedy in his life. Um, and so, so he's definitely the thing that, that rattles everyone. And even when you get into the plays act three, he is still bitter. He's still angry. Humanity has done him wrong. And as I say, there's, there's not a ton of lines, but boy, it's an interesting part. And I mentioned earlier, I think that, you know, people wonder whether the stage manager, um, Thornton Wilder was really the stage manager or vice versa. And I've also talked to people who wonder because there are aspects of Wilder's life. He was not embittered uh, as far as we know, but, but whether Simon Stimson, might be uh, Thornton Wilder's substitute mm -hmm. in the play. Of course, I guess when a playwright writes a play, everybody's a substitute to some degree. But but that comes up in the book. People talking about what who does who does Simon Stimson represent? Who well, and you know, Wilder was a very closeted homosexual, so there could be a lot of that in Simon. Uh, that. Uh, the secrets, Absolutely. The, the secrets, the depression, the, I don't think he was an alcoholic, but, um, you know. Uh, I, I, thought, I thought in your book, Howard, it was interesting to hear from Stephen Spinella, how the transformation that he found in the course of the, the book, you know, he thought it was, oh, just an old fashioned this and that. He, he ended up being completely changed by the production. Yeah, yeah I remember the there's Sorry, scene, the, uh, there was a scene uh, towards the end of the play. I mean, I think it's the end of Act Two, where Simon Stimson or Stephen Spinella he walks home drunk, and he the constable sees him, and Stephen and I shared a dressing room, and he he'd come off stage and go, "Gosh, I'm I'm so glad that's over." And I, and I remember the first time or two. This is on Broadway because I didn't uh, at Westport. I didn't share a dressing room with him but on Broadway. He said, because it's just so hard. He'd walk across, you know, he'd come, but the way he played it was just the, the heartbreak of being that outsider and being alone in that town. And there were no lines. And he just walked yep. across the stage. And he's you know, spoken about that was, uh, spoken was to. A lot of in his the life. genius yeah. of it was remarkable. People he don't realize, I think, yeah, people don't realize, I think, how very, very psychologically tough it is for an actor to play a certain kind of moment or a, or a certain kind of character. It can be very, very, I don't want to say damaging necessarily, but it's psychically tough. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you say, Jake? I mean, when you play somebody who's massively depressed or, or uh, terminally ill or um, you go on and on, it does take a toll, especially if you do it in a run, night after night after night, not just a take for a film where you also have to invest in it in an enormous way. But um, I don't think people realize that even some of the most bravura parts uh, that have at their core sadness and depression uh, are really, really take their toll on, a, on the soul of an actor. 
Yeah. And sometimes you, you, you think, I mean, when I was starting out, I was thinking, you know, you don't want to do that. You want to leave it behind and you can do that very easily and just do the part, but it really does sort of take over in a way when you are in a run or even just uh, working on it, it really does take over. So yeah. It's a, Not it's to dwell on that scene, but, but what's also fascinating is we talk about actors make choices here is a, there is a scene, it's a long scene, but it's right at the end of act one. And the person playing Simon Stimson has to make all these choices with absolutely nothing on the page saying what's going on. He comes in, he's probably drunk. How much do we see he's drunk? How much is he drunk but trying not to see him drunk? Is he angry? Is he pleading? Is he standoffish? Having seen over the course of the past couple of years, multiple productions of the play, it's really fascinating what people find in this moment when he comes up to Dr. Gibbs and the constable and, and they, uh, Doc Gibbs asks if he can walk Simon Simpson home. And Simon Stimson doesn't speak and walks off. Yeah. But in that moment, what do we learn? That's, I, I just keep going back to, there are all of these little things in our town. And again, to the idea of in the 21st century, when the stage manager is a woman, when uh, the Gibbses are played, um, are only speak Spanish at home, uh, I'm sorry, I've got it backwards. Uh, there was production at Miami New Drama where the Gibbses, the mother spoke Creole to her children at home and um, the Webbs only spoke Spanish at home. It's the same play, but they changed the language. How does that make the play resonate? Um, there are so many things that ping in part because I think, you know, Mark, I think you, you spoke about it almost seeming religious, even though Wilder wasn't particularly a religious man. I refer to the play as having a secular theology. It is about spirit. It is about purpose. It touches on things that religions have ritualized. And Wilder manages in the little microcosm to touch on the soul on our purpose, what do we realize? What is it to be alive? So whether it's secular theology, whether it's philosophy, it's, it's really quite extraordinary that way. Um, and the way he handles his vision of the afterlife is so powerful without ever being in the least bit religious. They're not in heaven, they're not in hell, they're, they're stuck. You know, that idea is, is an extremely depressing one um, and, and also oddly calming. Um, that community of the dead at the end of the play, uh, still a community, still a town of shared souls. You know, it's, it's very, very powerful. Well, not only does this discussion make me <laughs> want to direct a production of Our Town, but it, it certainly it makes me very eager to read your book, Howard. I can't thank you enough for uh, for talking with us today. Tell us when the book is going to be published. Is uh, the book is officially published on January 28th. Wonderful. Two days before my birthday. Um, I actually, Mark, since I know you haven't read the book um, yet, I just want to read you a little something from it, um, which is in my thank yous. Um, and I frankly wanted to thank everybody I've ever met. I thank all the people who helped me with the book, but um, I also thank Mark Lamus and the extraordinary cohort of artists he brought to Hartford stage from 1985 to 1993 for the best unaccredited graduate degree one in theater one could ask for. <laughs> thank you, Howard. <laughs> Lovely. That's very sweet. That's very sweet. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to work with you all those years ago. It was it was really wonderful. And I, I always think of Howard as being almost directly responsible for the Hartford stage, winning the Tony Award, the Regional Theater Tony Award when it did. He really worked very hard to make that happen. 
thank you to Jake. It's so great to see you, Jake, always. So great to see you too, Mark. And uh, Howard I'm and really Annie. working with you. And Annie, thank you so much. And, and and for all the insight and the background that you brought to this it was really, really helpful. And to the book, apparently. So I'm I'm very it makes me even Can we just say the title again? Another Day's Begun, Thornton Wilder's Our Town in the Twenty First Century. Great. It's a beautiful title. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Howard. Thank you.